growing up, I just don't feel sense of belonging anywhere at home. Uh, my parents were, they love me practically and uh, just maybe emotionally, uh, they, they wasn't there for me. And uh, I mean, in school, it's also challenging because because of my weight, you know, I, I'm in tough club, you know, what do you expect? You know? um, anyway, tough club means, you know, people who are overweight and, and uh, tend to get bullied, people laugh at me, you know. Um, and finally, um, I found a group of uh, uh, brothers, you know, uh, they are very brotherly, you know, they are very, um, I mean, in fact, one of them are a bit, a bit fatherly and uh, they include me in their activity. We start um, smoking, uh, a bit of drinking uh, and, uh, and we also uh, participate in stealing, you know, and it was, it was such a thrill. Uh, we will get into small fights and we feel very good about it because we can like, show that how manly we are. And that went on uh, all the way to uh, secondary school. So secondary school, I was, I was still uh, also in gang activity, but I, of course I live a double life. Uh, there are people who, who, who don't know that I'm, I'm in gang because in school, no, I'm a class chairman, no, I'm, I'm, I'm still uh, in leadership position, but yet uh, in gang, I was a small group leader. So there was once, uh, together with my gang member, you know, as usual, you know, being, you know, we walk you know, like that, you know, so we just walk like action, yeah, yeah, papa, yeah. Then, uh, then there was a group of uh, rival gang. Um, I don't really know them, but I think previously one of my members of them. So they round us up. They got more people, we got lesser people. And then they come to me and say, uh, where are you from? Uh, which gang you are from? Uh, what are you doing in this place? So don't be being a garang guy, you know, try to be brave. And so I spoke up and I realized that before I could even say anything, I was given a punch. Uh, the punch was very hard. Boom! Wah! I was like, Two things happened. First thing first, my head hit the wall, and secondly, I think in the midst of the, the, the punch, uh, I think I beat my, my, my lips. And I was like in the daze because I saw part of my lips was, was bleeding, you know, my lips were flapping. You know, uh, uh, the next moment I was pulled you know, uh, to one corner, they continued to whack me and, and my team. You know, they pulled out my ear start, you know, my, my ears was bleeding, you know, I got two ear hold, it was bleeding. Uh, I was in the days, I don't know what to do. Uh, uh, and thankfully, at that moment, uh, there was a member of public saying, Mata, Mata, police, police. At that moment, uh, some of my kids, hey, kin, kin, chow, chow, then we all run. <laughs> well, good afternoon, church. Now I see was blind, but now I see. All of us face challenges in life. Maybe today you're in church and you're hearing everything, you've been worshipping, you've just been seeing this video and something resonated in your heart. That maybe you're not in a gang, but you're in a situation where there seems to be no way out. You're just a little stuck. You're a little in this place of darkness and you're praying and asking and praying and seeking, but nothing seems to happen and there's this blindness around you and you're praying that you will see the light. Maybe you're here today, just like the story of Jeff, in some kind of situation, perhaps in relationship. How many of you love your spouse? Okay, half of you. The rest of the half, who, those who didn't raise your hand, uh, it's because you're not married. But you know, relationships, a marriage is difficult at times, isn't it? Those of you who know what I mean, just wave your hands. Okay, three of us now. The rest, no problem, wonderful marriage. Maybe you're here and your marriage is going through a very difficult time. You've been praying, you've been coming to church, you've been talking, but you're just stuck and there seems to be this darkness. Maybe you, how many of you haven't bought your Christmas presents and you know you're going to have some relationship issues later? <laughs> On Christmas Day and your spouse says, where's my present? But you say you don't present, right? Uh, and then... Uh, darkness and vow, it comes over your household. Maybe in the area of finances, there is a darkness. Perhaps you're in debt that you just cannot pay someone you've lent money to, and you know, and this is a situation that causes and envelopes you in darkness, and you've been praying to see the light. Maybe today you have a health issue, or maybe not yourself. A loved one is having a difficulty in the area of health, and you've been praying and asking, God, please come in. Please help, but nothing seems to happen. Today, church, I want us to know one thing. Jesus Christ is here. 
and he's there to meet our needs. And we're going to look in the Bible at one situation where someone was in darkness, but he finally saw the light. And we're going to look in the book of John, chapter 9, verse 1 to 12. Before that, let's just pray. Father, we want to ask that today, whatever blindness there is in our lives, I pray that we will see. We will see the truth. We will know you. We will make you known among the nations. But I pray, God, that the word of God today will not be here to tickle our ears, not to make us laugh, but there will be something that transforms our hearts, our souls, our minds, our spirits, that there will be such a revelation of who you are, of who we are in Christ. So God, come. Let your spirit come over our lives. Move in this place today. Let your manifest presence come. Let your anointing flow in our hearts in the name of Jesus. Amen. John chapter 9, 1 to 12, it says this. And he went along. He saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, Jesus said. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can walk. While I am in the world altogether, I am the light of the world. This is the time Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Tell the person beside you, Jesus is the light of the world. Okay, say with conviction now, okay? Jesus is the light of the world. Now tell the person beside you, you are not the light of the world. Because sometimes we think we are the savior of the world. We think we are there to rescue other people rather than turning to God. But Jesus said, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he does something that many of you will just... He spits on the ground, made some mud with the sliver and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he, said, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam, that means sand. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had been formerly who had formerly seen him begging, asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, No, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am that man. How then were your eyes open? They asked. He replied, The man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed. And then I could see. Where is this man? They asked him. I don't know. He was blind, right? So he didn't go. We wouldn't even recognize Jesus. I don't know. So the people got him. They brought him to the Pharisees. And the story goes on like this. The Pharisees, who are the teachers of the law, you know, very into rules, regulations, methodology, begin to interrogate him. Who did this? How did this happen? Because it was the Sabbath. And according to them, the Sabbath was the day you don't, don't do work. Even though a miracle occurred to them, it was work. So they would get frustrated because they knew Jesus was being mentioned here. And they began to interrogate the man. How did this happen? You're not really, you were never really blind. So not only that, they got his parents down and interrogated the parents. Parents, is this your son? He says he's blind. And the parents say, yeah, he was blind when he was born, but now you can see, that's all I know. But the man says this, you know, and they interrogate over and over and over again. And the parents begin to become afraid of them because for them, it was important for them to be in the, in the synagogue, worshipping God. But the Pharisees made it clear, if you declare Jesus is Lord, you'll be kicked out of the temple. So they didn't dare to confess at all. And they said, you can ask him, he's an adult now. So th the story goes on like this. A second time, they summoned the men, the Pharisees, who had been blind, give glory to God by telling the truth. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. But one thing I do know, altogether, I was blind, but now I see. And later, Jesus heard that he had been th they had thrown him up. And when he found them, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Remember, he was blind when Jesus put the slime on his eyes. So he wouldn't recognize who Jesus was. But this is the time Jesus reveals himself to him. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I have come into the world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. Today, if you are here in church and there is a blindness in your life, there is a blockage and you can't see ahead, let's believe in God for a miracle today. That today you will see the light. 
that God will remove that veil from your eyes and that you begin to restore, begin to receive the healing, begin to receive the miracle in your life. And what's the scripture telling us today? There are three principles that I want to share with us. And I'm going to entitle this the mad strategy. Okay, tell the person beside you, be mad. Tell them you're mad. What did Jesus give? What's the instruction? What's the lesson that we can hear from the scripture? If you're here today and you're having all these things in finances, in health, in relationship, and you're asking for God for a miracle today, this is the answer. Now, three principles, okay? Three things for us. The first one is this. M stands for make God bigger. Huh? What do you mean make God bigger? See, but very often, our eyes are just focused on our problem. And we magnify the problem until it becomes bigger than God. But how big is God? How big is God? Come on, respond. How big is God? Infinite. Shout what answers. How big is God to you? Is he bigger than his church? Don't know? How big is God? Jesus said. Okay, he asked. Because the, the disciples were asking, whose fault is it? Isn't it just like us? When you see a problem child, what's the first response we have? Why is this child like that? Who you blame? Parents, right? Same thing, even in Jesus' time. This guy blind, born blind, whose fault is it? Must be the parents. Uh, parents sin, that's why he's like that. But Jesus says this, it is not the fault of anyone, but this happened so that you can see what God can do. What's he telling us today? Magnify the Lord and make God bigger. Psalm 34 verse 3 says this, Oh, magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt His name together. What does magnify mean? It means to make God big. That's what it essentially is. See, when we worship God, we make Him big. When the Bible says magnify the Lord, why? Because so often we make God small. So how big is God? Okay, 10 of us here... Okay, how big is God? Very big. Magnify the Lord. Will you magnify the Lord over your situation? Because that is how restoration begins to take place, when you begin to magnify the Lord. But yet often our prayer makes God very small. The research says that the average person prays about three minutes. Average pastor prays about three minutes. The pastor prays an average of three minutes each day. Obviously, our church pastor, longer lah. Okay, this one doesn't include our church. But how often, do, how much do you pray? Maybe your prayer is only like this. Lord, thank you for this food. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Or maybe you went a little further. God, sanctify this food, make this food clean so that I don't get a stomach ache. Ever pray like that? We pray like that, don't we? God, sanctify this food. Please don't make it, don't make, I don't be sick. Please, can you... In all your power, in all your glory, sanctify this food, this plate. But what does magnify the Lord mean? Magnify means God, this food, nothing compared to you are the Lord of this country. You are the Lord of Singapore. I magnify you. You are so much bigger than this plate of rice, this plate of pork ribs. You are the Lord of Singapore. Lord, give me this nation. But magnify the Lord goes beyond that. Lord, you are the Lord of this earth. Bigger than Singapore. You are the Lord who created the earth. Tell the person beside you, God created the earth. What problem do you have today? Very small. Because we begin to magnify the Lord. And when you begin to magnify the Lord, you begin to realize that your problem, sanctify this food. Please sanctify God. You think you can in your holy power sanctify this, this plate of rice so that no get stomach? You can or not? And God sometimes will stay, stand there at us and ha, like that. You know, it's like, okay, give it to me, give it to me. Come on, give it to me. God will stay, give it to me. Then you say, God, you think you can make this food clean or not? And God goes, I created Singapore. I created the earth. Do you think I can sanctify this food? Maybe you're here with a financial situation. God, you know, I'm a little stuck here. Do you think you can help me in the area of finances? And God would say to us, I created Singapore. I created the earth. Can I resolve 
and solve your problems? Yeah. Magnify the Lord means saying this, God, you are the Lord of our solar system. How big is earth? Very small. Right? The third planet. Who created the solar system? Who created? Answer, only one answer. Lah. Okay, the answer lah, is God. Okay, Who created the system, solar system? God. How big is our God? Pretty big. How big is your problem? Very small. Why? Because we begin to magnify the Lord. How big is our solar system? In the Milky Way galaxy, our solar system is just about this dot here. And in our solar system, the Milky Way galaxy, is billions of stars, billions of solar systems. How big is our God? Pretty big. And the Hubble telescope, you know, a number of years ago, over a, a, a series of 12 days, the, the Hubble telescope in space just captured pictures. And this was the pictures that were sent back to Earth. How big is the Milky Way galaxy? Maybe just one tiny year. How big is our God? Pretty big. And the Bible tells us, He who created the heavens and the earth, can He not also solve our difficulty, our finances, our health, our relationships? Why? Because when we magnify the Lord, our problems become very small. But so often, we magnify our problems. Well, you know, my finances... Very difficult, you know. You know, my relationship, it stinks now. It's in a situation like no hope. And we make it so big and we make God so small. Yet today, God will say to us, how big is God? How big do you think He is? Oh, magnify the Lord and make Him big. You know, a number of years ago, I, I had an accident where I accidentally slashed my, my thumb. And it obviously, it bled with a pen knife and had to go to the hospital, you know, had, had it stitched up. And the next day was a church camp. And over there, you know, I was just whining. Oh, you know, my thumb, you know. I just wanted the pity of everyone, right? Oh, my thumb. I love Jesus, but my thumb is hurting, you know. And then one, there were three of us. I still remember we were, we were trying to build a, a fire and I would just, you know, my thumb is so painful. You know, I s slashed it open, had stitches. And then the next guy <laughs> said this, you know, a few years ago, uh, my toe uh, had such a tremendous slash uh, that the bones start coming out. And when, when I went to the hospital, he was, he was like a gangster. Like, you know, like you saw Jeff. He was secret society before, uh, but then got, got saved. You know, when the doctor was stitching, doctor told him to look away. He said, no, I must see it. Well, then suddenly my, my little thumb stitches like didn't seem so big after all. And after he said that, another guy, you know, I was climbing the ladder and I fell down and my arm popped out, you know. And suddenly the two of us, okay lah, we're not worthy. <laughs> Why? Because sometimes we big, so big that when we compare with something else, it becomes so small. And God will say to us, how big's your problem? Will you magnify me and make me big? Make me bigger than your situation. Maybe this word is for you today. You're, you're stuck and you just don't know. But God is saying to you, magnify my name. Make me bigger than your situation. The Bible, the Bible tells us in David and Goliath, many of you know the story. David was just a young chap facing a giant, Goliath. And Goliath sees David and says to David, Why, wow, you're sending me like a dog. Who do you think I am? Come, I'll destroy you, I'll tear you, feed you to the animals. But David comes against a giant. How? What does David do in 1 Samuel? He says, I come against you in the name of the Lord of hosts. Why? What did David realize? He realized that he needed to magnify the Lord. While all the Israelites were looking at how big their problem was in Goliath, David made God bigger. And we know in the Bible, when Goliath came, David went charging, swung his sling with one rock. Right in the devil, and not, not in Goliath's head. And David would go there, chop off the head of Goliath. And David showed us how to get a head in life. <laughs> Some of you, ah, I don't get it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I've been working really hard on that. 
How big is God? David did that. He magnified the Lord. Paul and Silas in jail were thrown in for declaring the truth. Yet what did they do in prison? They begin to worship God. Who compares with you? You are magnificent eternally. I don't, they probably didn't sing that. They just started declaring and what happened after that as they begin to magnify the Lord. An earthquake took place. And then they walked out of prison. And then the jailer and everybody got saved because they saw the power of God. What's God saying to us today? Will you worship the Lord in the midst of your situation? Will you worship the Lord in the midst of your health, your finances, in your relationship difficulty? Will you still magnify the Lord and make Him big? Will you? Join me. Let's do that. Let's magnify the Lord together. King Jehoshaphat, king of, of uh, Israel, will come against the enemies and they will begin to be very worried. Why? Because surrounded by the enemies and they didn't know what to do. And he begins to consult the Lord and God tells them, I'll give you victory. So imagine me. When I read scripture, I like to imagine a little Hollywood, I guess. So King Jehoshaphat stands in front of the Israelites. Israelites, people of God. Everybody goes, because they're afraid. They see the enemies around. We're going to battle. Say who? Then everybody goes, who? Yeah. We're going to fight against the enemy. Who? And everyone gets excited. But God's going to do something different. Who? All the musicians, all the worship team. I want you to stand in front of the soldiers. It's suddenly no more. Who? The worship team is going, ah. Yeah, worship team, I want you to stand in front and I want you to lead the, the army. Eh? And how are you going to lead? You're going to stand in front, you're going to start singing. To go to battle, you want them to be in front, I can hear all the worship team like, oh, I don't want to be a musician anymore. I don't, want, I don't want to play trumpet, and I don't want to do all these things. What do you mean, send me in front? I don't have a sword, I only blow my trumpet, my trumpet cannot use, can hit someone on the head, but I can't do anything else, there's no sword. But he says, go in front. And I can only imagine all the, is the people, the soldiers standing behind like, wow, I don't know what's this, man. I don't know whether the king has gone a little cuckoo or what's happening here. But he says, go. And God says this, he'll give you the victory when you begin to worship him. And what did they do? They, they, they declared this, the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever and ever. Okay, let's just read that together once to go. Okay, tell the person beside you, one to go. Now say it to yourself, self, the Lord is good and His mercy endures forever and ever. So we're going to try this, yeah? I want all the ladies here to sing after me. Can? Ladies, wave your hands. Can sing or not? Can, huh? You got, we're going to try. Okay, wait, we'll see if this comes together, otherwise it may all just fall apart. Never mind, we try anyway. I just, I'm going to sing it first, then just sing after me, yeah? The Lord is good, and His mercy endures forever and ever. Okay? Simple or not? Okay, we try again, huh? If you can catch the tune, if you really sound siawan, you, you just say, The Lord is good, His mercy endures forever, huh? The ladies, all the ladies sing with me. The Lord is good, and His mercy endures Forever and ever. One more time. The Lord is good. And ever. Try again. Okay, all the ladies, come on. Now bring it out. You're going to be leading the battle. All the ladies, come on. One, two, go. The Lord. One more time. The Lord is good. Okay, all the men, you're going to sing. I'm going to teach you your part. Huh? So we're going to do like a harmony. Lah. Try, huh? try. The Lord is good and His mercy endures forever and ever. Guys, huh? the Lord is good and His mercy endures forever and ever. Come on, all the men, we're going to battle also. The Lord is good. Hey, the ladies, the ladies more kila lah. Okay, guys, 
One more time, okay? Sing it like you really mean it. We're going to go for battle. You're going to declare. You're going to call heaven and the earth. One, two, go. The guys. The Lord is good and his mercy endures forever and ever. Okay, remember your part. Ladies, remember your part. The Lord is good and his mercy endures forever and ever. The Lord is good. Okay, all together. One, two, go. The Lord. Okay, that's the guy's part, huh? The lady's part is this. The Lord is good and His mercy endures forever. Okay, all the ladies. The Lord is good and His mercy endures forever and ever. Again, the guys. The Lord is good. Forever and I want you to close your eyes and just declare that. The Lord is good. Forever and one more time to the Lord. The Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. Facing your situation, we're gonna declare that. The One more time, just worship the Lord. The Lord is good, and His mercy endures forever and ever. Can you imagine that? As they began to do that, God came in. God intervened, and the enemies were scattered. What is your situation now? What difficulty are you facing now? Face it by magnifying the Lord. Oh, magnify the Lord. Make God bigger. Second thing is this. Begin to act on His Word. Okay, tell the person beside you, act on His Word. Don't act on feelings. Because many of us, we act only on our feelings. And maybe you had too much pizza, you feel a certain way today. Uh, I feel, I don't feel like coming. I don't feel like doing this. Act on the Word of God, not based on your feeling. John 9, 6-7 says this. After saying this, Jesus spit on the ground, made some mud with the sliver and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told them, wash in the pool. Jesus spit. That's what we do in our altar call. When you come forward, we, we just spit and we pull the hands. Jesus spit, you know, I mean, kind of gross, right? Jesus, can't you be a little more dignified and just say, be healed? But Jesus spit. And today, if you got healing, you need healing, healing of your headache, anything, today's ministry will be doing that. But don't be offended. It's okay. Because healing comes. He didn't just do it on one occasion. Jesus also did it with the man who was deaf and mute. He took him aside, away from the crowd. Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears. Then he spit. Boy. And touched the man's tongue. Can you imagine that? I always think that the blind guy had it easy because he never saw it coming. <laughs> but the, the, the man who couldn't speak, can you what, imagine he sees everything, Jesus, hi, boy, and comes to the man and he's like, <coughs> what do you think the first words will come out? Hey, hey, what are you doing? Hey, hey, I can speak. Hey, what's going on? Oh, how, how come I got some sound I can hear, I can speak? Why? Because they acted based on the Word of God. The Bible says this. Jesus said, go wash your face. Go wash, go wash in the sea. Hey, go wash in the, the, the pool of Siloam. And the man just did it. He didn't argue. He didn't question Jesus' methodology. Maybe if you were there, just like the Pharisees, how dare he spit? Not just any ordinary spit, but one hakalugui spit. How dare he? Why? Because they were more concerned with methodology. But Jesus said to us today, do you believe? Even if it's not the way you like God to do things, will you act on His Word and not based on your feelings and not based on what you think God should do, but act on what God says? The Bible tells us the story of the centurion, the soldier of 100 
Centurion was not far from the house. Jesus was not far from the house. Centurion's servant was sick. And the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not con even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word. Okay, everyone, say the word. And my servant will be healed, for I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes. And that one comes, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does this. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him and turning to the crowd, following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the man who had been sent returned to the house and found that the servant was well. Why, what was the faith seen here? All Jesus had to do was say the word and it will come to pass. And I always challenge us as a church, do you know the word of God? Okay, if you have your Bible, just lift up your Bible. Okay, lift up your telephone. How many of you still use the Bible with the paper form? Anyone? Okay, some of us. You know, I, I think the, one of the main difference for us as parents uh, is seeing, reading the scripture and let, letting our children model us. But I know now because it's all on our phones, our children just see us on the phone all the time, right? But we model for them. So on occasion, take out the Bible, perhaps on Sundays, read it together as a family. Yeah, so that they begin to adopt that same discipline. But if your Bible or telephone or whatever version of the Bible comes from, wave it up. Okay, wave it up and you just repeat after me. Everyone, everyone, come home. Okay, say this to me. This is my Bible. I will read it. I will memorize it. I will live by it all the days of my life. That's the Word of God. Act on the Word of God. If you don't know the Word of God, very hard to act. You'll go based on feeling. You'll go based on what someone tells you. Oh, you should do this. Okay. But it's not the truth at all. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall do what? Set you free. So learn to act on the word of God. One action was all Jesus wanted the man to do. One action made all the difference. One. Just one thing. Jesus said, go, and the man went. Jesus said, come, and you just come. One action makes all the difference. How many of you have started your Christmas celebrations already? All the feasting has begun. Anyone? Some of us. How many of you, over Christmas, you, eat, you tend to eat a little more? Oh, this is very healthy. And only a quarter of us. Come on, we eat a little more, right, during the season from Christmas all the way to New Year. Otherwise, the church won't cater food for us, eh? Oh, okay, we all eat, right? And we eat a little more. And how many of you, every, every beginning of the year, you say, my New Year's resolution is I'm going to lose weight? Anyone? Maybe you're sitting, how many of you are sitting next to someone whose resolution is always to lose weight? Yeah, so what do you do? All you have to do is one thing differently. So if that's your resolution, I want to lose weight tomorrow, what do you do differently? Tomorrow, you put your running shoes next to your bed. Tonight, put your socks and your running shoes next to your bed. When you wake up, you see your shoes there, you put on your socks. You put on your shoes, then you walk to the door, open the door, close it, then go back to your bed and lie down. You have just changed one pattern of your behavior. Just one thing, and then the next day, you do something else. You improve, you grow, but changing your action. If you're here today and you have a marriage difficulty and you've been doing the same thing over and over again, hoping things will be different, you need to change something. And you've been praying, God, give me an answer. God, help me in my marriage. Maybe God will say this to you today. Tomorrow, make an appointment with the, with the pastor. Make an appointment with the marriage counselor. Make an appointment to do something about it. You've been praying all this while. Five years, I have to live with this man. I have to live with this woman. And that's all you've been doing, complaining, complaining, complaining. But today God says to you, change. Tomorrow call. After service, look for a pastor. Pastor, please, we need help. And that begins the process of change. One action makes all the difference. One word, will you act on it? Will you change? Someone sent this to me, which I thought was quite appropriate and it's a little silly, but one word change makes all the difference. Uh, it, it started because of this pastor named 
uh, Alfred Spooner. They call it Spoonerisms, where sometimes we get our words mixed up. Instead of saying, the Lord is my shepherd, it becomes, the sword is my leopard. Yeah, and this is a story. One word change makes the story all so different. Once upon a time, in a foreign country, foreign country in case you still don't quite get it, huh? in a foreign country, there lived a beautiful girl. Her name was Rinda Seller. Cinderella, some of you are like, I still don't get it, okay? Now Rinda Seller lived with the muggly other and her two set business. And in the same foreign country, there lived a prensome hints. Handsome prince, huh? One day, the prince of Hins decided to have a fancy fall. He invited people from Ralph's amount among the pitch reaper. But Rinda Seller could not go because all she had to wear was some old dirty dags or dirty rags. So she just kept down and scried, hoo-boo, hoo-boo. She was kitten there scrying when all of a sudden, a Gary Ford mother appeared. And she waved her magic man. And all of a sudden, there appeared before her sick boat with Hicks white sources to take her to the Bansy Fall. But now she said to Rinder Seller, Rinder Seller, you must be home before Nid might, or I'll burn you into a pumpkin. So Rinder Seller went to the Bansy Fall where she met the Prensome Hints who had been watching through a wooden window. She and the Prensome Hints, Nance all died till Nid might, and they lay in fur. Suddenly the mid clock struck night. Rinder Seller stays down the rest, and then she reached the rotom, she slopped her dripper. She dropped her slipper. Eh? The next day, the prince of Hints went all around the corn country looking for her beautiful burl who had slopped her dripper. He came to Rinderseller's house. He tried it on Rinderseller's muggly other and it fitted it. He tried it on her two sigli oosters and it didn't fit. He tried it on Rinderseller and it fit it. It was exactly the side rise. The next day, Rinderseller and the prince of Hints were married and they lived happily Hepta Hepworth. Now the moral of the story is this. If you ever loll in fur with the Pransom Hints, be sure and slop your dripper. Change. One change makes all the difference. Will you today change and act on the word rather than your feelings? Will you change rather than what I think? This is what God says and I'm going to act on the truth. Jesus said, Come. Follow me. Just come. And I'll make you fishers of men. Jesus said, come to me all who are weary. Come. Very simple. It's not like very complicated. It was just obedience. And that obedience in faith saw miracles. What's preventing you from the breakthrough? You've been seeking and wanting breakthrough, but some things just hold you back. Perhaps it's a pride issue. Well, I want a breakthrough, but I want to do it my way. I'm not going to come to the front because if God is God, He can touch me any way He wants. True? But it's actually a pride issue. Maybe pride's holding you from your breakthrough. Maybe there's fear. What, what will people say? What, what, you know, what, embarrassingly, I don't want to cry before God because I'm a man. I don't want to cry. I don't want to fall down. It's a pride and a fear. Maybe there's just unbelief. And there's something within us that hinders us from the breakthrough. But today, you want the breakthrough to come, you want to see, be willing to come to Jesus and act on His Word. Some of us are just so concerned with the house. How is this going to happen? And that's what the Pharisees did. How did Jesus, how did you get here? How, how, how? And they were so focused rather than focusing on the who. Today, focus on Jesus. Act on what Jesus says rather than what my friends say, act on who the Lord Jesus Christ is. And finally, don't miss the greatest miracle. Jesus sees the man and he says, do you believe in the Son of Man? And the guy says, I don't know, sure, I don't, but I don't know who he is. In fact, you've seen him. And his response is, Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. See, healing is one thing. It's external. But salvation, believing in Jesus Christ, is internal. And that is eternal. You can have restoration in your marriage, but if your life does not change, if there is no salvation, after a while, it's just a good marriage. But eternity without God is emptiness. 
don't miss the greatest miracle. So do you believe? Jesus would ask us that question. Do you believe? Do you believe? Are you willing to have your life turned inside out? And a man, because he chose to declare Jesus Christ as the King of Kings, as the prophet, he was kicked out of the temple, ostracized, yet he knew what was really important. He believed and he worshipped the Lord. Paul the Apostle would say this, Philippians 2, 12 to 13, Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill His good purposes. Is God working in you so that you work out your faith? So when, rather than saying, if I ask you, how are you? Rather than say, up and down, learn to say, in and out. Okay, how are you? In and out. Why? Because your life depends on how much God works in you. Rather than up and down. And if you allow God to work something, a miracle in you, what comes out? A life full of miracles. A life full of blessings. So how are you? Try again, huh? How are you? In and out. It's Him working in me so that I begin to work out my faith in fear and trembling of the Lord. We saw the story of Jeff, and we're going to watch part two of it. But I just want us to begin to realize we have an awesome God, a miracle working God. Anyway, part two. Then I was running. At that moment, I heard a familiar voice that I have not heard for a long, long time. He said, Jeffrey, do you want to continue to live this kind of life? Yeah, I was shocked, you know. My heart beat very fast. I was in pain. I was like, who is talking to me? But I remember this is the same familiar voice that when I was a little boy, when I attend the pop camp, and I, and I just don't know what to say, but the Lord continued. The Lord said, that, Jeffrey, if you continue to live this kind of life, what kind of future will you have? The Lord gave me a vision that I will still continue in vices, I will still continue to do many stupid things, I will still run away from police, I will still involve in fight. My future is in a mess. But the Lord presented to me another vision. The, the, in the vision, I, I, I saw that things are very bright and uh, I go back to church, uh, my future is bright. I mean, I couldn't explain why so bright about that, that future then and then, but I know in my heart that the Lord has called me. The Lord has called me back to him. I said, God, really, you know, after this incident, I recognize that I have enough. I don't want to continue to live this kind of life. There's no future. And uh, I said, God, you must help me. So, uh, and all this happened is while I was running. Uh, I was cleaning up myself in one of the toilet. And I said, God, yes, I will come back, but you must help me. Because living in gang is not easy. Because of the influence, because of the level that I was at. Subsequently, the Lord did a few miracles. I mean, I consider it a miracle because it, 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 was, it was out of the world. First thing, the Lord miraculously deleted my phone number from my gang leader's phone. Either that or delete from his memory. How do I know? Because instead of him calling my handphone, he was calling my home. And subsequently, actually my, my gang came uh, to look for me in school. Uh, front gate, I escaped from the back gate. You know, I, and they came from the back gate and escaped from the front gate. So I think this is the second miracle. But I think more, more, the greater miracle, I just want to say is, um, I begin to see the light. I begin to see uh, the greater purpose in God. Um, and, uh, and in church, uh, I was given the opportunity uh, to, to serve. And the Lord grew my sense of belonging in the community of God. At that point in time, I grew closer to my own cell group. So I was involved. Uh, Subsequently, as a cell leader, supervisor, I was a call leader of youth church. And uh, I was also amazed along the way. And, and eventually, you know, uh, the Lord called me full-time uh, as a youth pastor. And I recognized something. It is true that uh, when I was pursuing the things in the world, when I was being uh, blinded by my own insecurity and uh, my, my, my lack of uh, sense of belonging, uh, I chose to pursue everything except for God. But when I return to God, my eyes is open and I was given much more than what I could ask or imagine. Today as a youth pastor, uh, as a father of uh, two daughters, not forgetting my wife, a wonderful wife, as a family, uh, the Lord has blessed, my, blessed me a lot. 
And for that, I'm very thankful. Uh, indeed, all glory to God. Amen.